So... The slurring voice was as soft as the sound of the doors sliding in their tracks. You are not who I expected. For a brief moment, Rand stared. The tall man with the shaven head who had stepped into the room wore a long trailing blue robe, and his fingernails were so long that Rand wondered if he could handle anything. The two men standing obsequiously behind him had only half their dark hair shaved, the rest hanging in a dark braid down each man's right cheek. One of them cradled a sheathed sword in his arms. It was only a moment he had for staring, then screens toppled to reveal, at either end of the room, a doorway crowded with four or five Shan Chan soldiers, bareheaded but armored, and swords in hand. You are in the presence of the High Lord Turok, the man who carried the sword began, staring at Rand and the others angrily, but a brief motion of a finger with a blue lacquered nail cut him short. The other servant stepped forward with a bow and began undoing Turok's robe. When one of my guards was found dead, the shaven-headed man said calmly, I suspected the man who calls himself Fane. I have been suspicious of him since Juan died so mysteriously, and he has always wanted that dagger. He held out his arms for the servant to remove his robe. Despite his soft, almost singing voice, hard muscles roped his arms and smooth chest, which was bare to a blue sash holding wide white trousers that seemed made of hundreds of pleats. He sounded uninterested and indifferent to the blades in their hands. And now to find strangers with not only the dagger, but the horn. It will please me to kill one or two of you for disturbing my mourning. Those who survive will tell me of who you are and why you came. He stretched out a hand without looking. The man with the scabbarded sword laid the hilt in the hand and drew the heavy curved blade. I would not have the horn damaged. Turok gave no other signal, but one of the soldiers stalked into the room and reached for the horn. Rand did not know whether he should laugh or not. The man wore armor, but his arrogant face seemed as oblivious to their weapons as Turok was. Matt put an end to it. As the Shan Chan reached out his hand, Matt slashed it with the ruby-hilted dagger. With a curse, the soldier leaped back, looking surprised. And then he screamed. It chilled the room, held everyone where they stood in astonishment. The trembling hand he held up in front of his face was turning black, darkness creeping outwards from the bleeding gash that crossed his palm. He opened his mouth wide and howled, clawing at his arm, then his shoulder. Kicking, jerking, he toppled to the floor, thrashing on the silken carpet, shrieking as his face grew black and his dark eyes bulged like overripe plums, until a dark, swollen tongue gagged him. He twisted, choking raggedly, heels drumming, and did not move again. Every bit of his exposed flesh was black as putrid pitch and looked ready to burst at a touch. Matt licked his lips and swallowed. His grip shifted uneasily on the dagger. Even Turok stared, open-mouthed. You see, Ingtar said softly, we are no easy meat. Suddenly, he leaped over the corpse, toward the soldiers still goggling at what was left of the man who had stood at their shoulders only moments before. Chenoa! he cried. Follow me! Huron leaped after him, and the soldiers fell back before them, the sounds of steel on steel rising. The Shan Chan at the other end of the room started forward as Ingtar moved, but then they were falling back too, before Matt's thrusting dagger, even more than from the axe Perrin swung with wordless snarls. In the space of heartbeats, Rand stood alone, facing Turok, who held his blade upright before him. His moment of shock was gone. His eyes were sharp on Rand's face. The black and swollen body of one of his soldiers might as well not have existed. It did not seem to exist for the two servants either, any more than Rand and his sword existed, or the sounds of fighting, fading now from the rooms to either side, out into the house. The servants had begun calmly folding Turok's robe as soon as the High Lord took his sword, and had not looked up even for the dead soldiers' shrieks. Now they knelt beside the door and watched with impassive eyes. I suspected it might come to you and me. Turok spun his blade easily, a full circle one way, then the other, his long nailed fingers moving delicately on the hilt. His fingernails did not seem to hamper him at all. You are young. 
Let us see what is required to earn the heron on this side of the ocean. Suddenly, Rand saw. Standing tall on Turok's blade was a heron. With the little training he had, he was face to face with a real blade master. Hastily, he tossed the fleece-lined cloak aside, ridding himself of weight and encumbrance. Turok waited. Rand desperately wanted to seek the void. It was plain he would need every shred of ability he could muster, and even then his chances of leaving the room alive would be small. He had to leave alive. Egwene was almost close enough for him to shout to her, and he had to free her somehow. But Sidene waited in the void. The thought made his heart leap with eagerness at the same time that it turned his stomach. But just as close as Egwene were those other women, Damani. If he touched Sidene, and if he could not stop himself channeling, they would know, Theron had told him. No, and wonder. So many, so close. He might survive Turok only to die facing Damani. And he could not die before Egwene was free. Rand raised his blade. Turok glided toward him on silent feet. Blade rang on blade like hammer on anvil. From the first, it was clear to Rand that the man was testing him, pushing only hard enough to see what he could do, then pushing a little harder, then just a little harder still. It was quick wrists and quick feet that kept Rand alive as much as skill. Without the void, he was always half a heartbeat behind. The tip of Turok's heavy sword made a stinging trench just under his left eye. A flap of coat sleeve hung away from his shoulder, the darker for being wet. Under a neat slash beneath his right arm, precise as a tailor's cut, he could feel warm dampness spreading down his ribs. There was disappointment on the High Lord's face. He stepped back with a gesture of disgust. Where did you find that blade, boy? Or do they here truly award the heron to those no more skilled than you? No matter. Make your peace. It is time to die. He came on again. The void enveloped Rand. Sidene flowed toward him, glowing with the promise of the one power, but he ignored it. It was no more difficult than ignoring a barbed thorn twisting in his flesh. He refused to be filled with the power, refused to be one with the male half of the true source. He was one with the sword in his hands, one with the floor beneath his feet, one with the walls, one with Turok. He recognized the forms the High Lord used. They were a little different from what he had been taught, but not enough. The swallow takes flight met parting the silk. Moon on the water met the wood grouse dances. Ribbon in the air met stones falling from the cliff. They moved about the room as in a dance, and their music was steel against steel. Disappointment and disgust faded from Turok's dark eyes, replaced by surprise, then concentration. Sweat appeared on the High Lord's face as he pressed Rand harder. Lightning of three prongs met leaf on the breeze. Rand's thoughts floated outside the void, apart from himself, hardly noticed. It was not enough. He faced a blade master, and with the void and every ounce of his skill, he was barely managing to hold his own. Barely. He had to end it before Turok finally did. Sidene, no. Sometimes it is necessary to sheathe the sword in your own flesh. But that would not help Egwene either. He had to end it now. Now! Turok's eyes widened as Rand glided forward. So far, he had only defended. Now he attacked all out. The boar rushes down the mountain. Every movement of his blade was an attempt to reach the High Lord. Now all Turok could do was retreat and defend down the length of the room, almost to the door. In an instant, while Turok still tried to face the boar, Rand charged. The river undercuts the bank. He dropped to one knee, blade slashing across. He did not need Turok's gasp or the feel of resistance to his cut to know. He heard two thumps and turned his head, knowing what he would see. He looked down the length of his blade, wet and red, to where the High Lord lay, sword tumbled from his limp hand, a dark dampness staining the birds woven in the carpet under his body. Turok's eyes were still open, but already filmed with death. The void shook. He had faced Trollocs before, faced Shadow Spawn. Never before had he confronted a human being with a sword except in practice or bluff. I just killed a man.